Hello, my name is uh, Aaron Burke. Um, on behalf of uh, UCLA's Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, which highlights Professor Kerry Sonia of Colby College. The title of today's talk is Can These Bones Live? The Politics of Death in the Hebrew Bible. This event is part of a Bible and the Ancient World series and is co-sponsored by UCLA's Center for the Study of Religion and the UCLA Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, my own home department as an archaeologist working uh, in Israel. We would like to thank you for staying socially distant and intellectually engaged by joining us for these virtual events. And again, we look forward very much to the time that we can be in person and host uh, scholars like uh, Carrie um, at UCLA for you to um, introduce, to introduce you to and, and for you to meet. Now, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Sonia. Carrie Sonia received her PhD in Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean from the Department of Religious Studies at Brown University, and she teaches biblical literature and its reception at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. Her research focuses on family and household religion in the received traditions of the Hebrew Bible, material culture of the Iron Age and Second Temple period, and, the, and Northwest Semitic inscriptions. Her current book project examines the social and ritual dimensions of childbirth and miscarriage in the Hebrew Bible and is supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, today, we will be looking specifically at her book on uh, the cult of dead kin. The cult of dead kin in ancient West Asia and, uh, was a complex of practices in which the living offered care to the dead in the form of food and drink offerings, commemorative monuments, invocation of the names of the dead, and protection, and when necessary, even repatriation of human remains. This cultic care negotiated uh, the ongoing relationships between the living and the dead, and in, so, in doing so, helped structure social, political, uh, and topographical landscapes in terms of the past. Dr. Sonia's talk examines the nature of the Israelite cult of the dead kin, of dead kin, and focusing, uh, focuses on its role within the family and its relationship to the Jerusalem temple cult. Contrary to previous studies, she argues that centralized forms of cult, including the Jerusalem temple, do not attempt to suppress the cult of the dead kin, but rather continue to draw upon its imagery and individual practices in order to articulate ideologies regarding Israel and its patron deity. I'm very excited about this talk today, and I hope that you will uh, enjoy it as well. Uh, without further ado, I turn over the floor to Dr. Kerry Sonia. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the Levy Center for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and special thanks both to Chelsea White and David Wu for organizing it, and to Professor Aaron Burke for being my conversation partner today. So I'm just very quickly going to pull up the slideshow that I'm going to be using for my talk. So if you just give me a second, hopefully the technology will be on our side. That's great. All right. So can everybody see it? The slideshow? All right, perfect. All right. So I'm delighted to be here to talk about my first book, Caring for the Dead in Ancient Israel, which was published by SBL Press in 2020, which, as the title suggests, examines the care and commemoration of the dead in ancient Israel and more broadly, thinks about the care and commemoration of the dead um, and how death shapes the social and political landscapes of the living. So what interests me in the topic of the book is what actually interests me more broadly in the study of religion. I'm fascinated by the stories that people tell about themselves and how various non-obvious beings like deities, demons, and the dead structure and expand the horizons of those stories. And so on this point, I'm reminded of the provocative opening of Thomas LeCur's book titled The Work of the Dead, which you can see here, when he states, the dead body matters everywhere and across time, as well as in particular times and particular places. It matters because the living need the dead more than the dead need the living. It matters because the dead make social worlds. It matters because we cannot bear to live at the borders of our mortality, end quote. So my area of expertise is the Hebrew Bible, the preferred scholarly term for the Tanakh or the Old Testament. So in the case of the Hebrew Bible, what is the work of the dead in this literature? Where do the dead appear 
in narrative texts, in ritual prescriptive texts, in legal material? And how are they treated, both by characters within the biblical text, but also by the biblical writers themselves? What are the assumptions in these texts about what the dead can and do, in fact, do? The more we delve into these seemingly straightforward questions, we find that the answers are anything but straightforward. And in fact, there remains today much debate among scholars of the Hebrew Bible about how to best understand these different texts within the Hebrew Bible that talk about the dead. So my study focuses on some of these persistent problems that we find in the scholarly discourse surrounding the dead in the Hebrew Bible and Israelite religion. And I'm highlighting just a few of these questions here today. So first, how do we define and what terms should we be using when we refer to when we refer to this ritual care and commemoration of the dead? Is it ancestor cult? Is it cult of the dead? Or is it something else? And what's at stake in the terminology that we're using anyway? The second major cluster of questions has to do with the parameters of this ritual care. What kinds of practices does this ritual phenomenon entail? Who engages in these practices, both ideally, but also pragmatically? And third, what is the relationship between this ritual care and other forms of Israelite religion? particularly the Yahwistic religion prescribed by biblical writers and the cultic apparatus of the Jerusalem temple. So as you'll see throughout this talk, I refer to this ritual care as the cult of dead kin. I also use this terminology throughout my book, and I'll say a little bit more about this preferred terminology in just a minute. So regarding the second cluster of questions that I've just identified, I argue for an expansion of the cult of dead kin to include, include some practices that have been overlooked by previous studies. So in addition to food offerings or invocation of the name of the dead or the construction of commemorative monuments, I argue that we also need to be thinking about the role of human remains, how they're protected, and how in some cases they're repatriated. So regarding the third cluster of questions that you see on the slide here, I examine the relationship between the cult of dead kin and other rituals pertaining to the dead, especially necromancy, arguing that these are separate cultic phenomena, though they are sometimes or even often conflated in previous scholarship. So bringing these three components together, I re-examine a common argument among scholarly reconstructions of the cult of dead kin. Contrary to previous studies, I argue that centralized forms of cult, including the Jerusalem temple, do not attempt to suppress the cult of dead kin, but rather continue to draw upon its imagery and individual practices in order to articulate ideologies about Israel's patron deity, Yahweh. But before I get into those main arguments in the book, I want to first identify some things about my approach to the topic. So first of all, I'm really interested in the role of material culture. And so that comes through in this book because I'm interested not only in biblical texts, but also epigraphic evidence, but also in addition to epigraphic evidence, grave goods, and also the tombs themselves, the kinds of spaces where these rituals may have taken place and what they reflect or might reflect about the cult of dead kin in ancient Israel and Judah. So here are just a couple of examples of some of the epigraphic evidence I use in the book. So here you see an image of what's called the, the inscription from the tomb of the royal steward. And as you can see from the translation below, we can glean from this inscription some important things about conceptions of the dead, but also what people are really concerned about when it comes to burial in ancient Israel in Judah. As this inscription suggests, people are very concerned with the possibility of grave robbery. And so we see in this inscription an attempt to dissuade any potential grave robbers, saying that there's nothing of material value here to be looted, right? There are no, there's no silver or gold in this in this tomb, it's just the bones of the person itself. In another inscription, this one from Kirbath al Kom, you can see that we have this invocation of the deity in this space within the tomb. Now there's been a lot of really great recent scholarship um, done on this, this site, particularly uh, by Jeremy Smoke, who actually is, uh, uh, who teaches at UCLA. 
So in looking at this particular inscription, you can think then about in invoking the deity into the space of the tomb, we get a sort of complicating factor. It, it sort of complicates this maybe oversimplified notion that the realm of the deity and the realm of the dead are totally separate, right? As the priestly writers of the biblical text might have us assume, right? But here, instead of there being this stark, you know, line of separation between where the deity can go and where the dead can go, there's this invitation of the deity into the tomb space itself. So this is also useful in sort of giving us more nuance and thinking about different conceptions and ideologies that populated this religious landscape um, in Iron Age Israel and Judah. Another major assumption um, uh, in this, this book and really influences my approach to the topic is that I'm thinking about Israelite religion as part of a broader religious landscape of ancient West Asia and thinking about how useful comparative analysis can be and really uh, and should be um, in thinking through the cult of dead kin. But that being said, we also have to be careful with that comparative analysis. As the map indicates, this is a huge geographic region, right? And we have to be careful not to overemphasize similarities between different corpora um, talking about the dead, and in doing so, lose sight of all the important differences um, between these different corpora and the societies that they come from. Another important aspect of this, this project is really building on recent discourse in the scholarly literature that has really gotten more and more interested in family and household religion. So here in the slide, you see just a couple of recent works that have been hugely influential in my own scholarship um, that really are thinking through not just specific case studies in ancient West Asia, but thinking more broadly and theoretically about how we can best approach family and household religion in the ancient world. And this is a really important aspect of the project, partly because this book is trying to reframe the cult of dead kin as being inextricably part of family and household religion. The many previous studies have looked at the cult of dead kin or ancestor cult, as it appears in a lot of those previous studies, as being this sort of foreign or um, illicit form of, of religious practice or even characterizes magic in some previous studies. And so I'm really trying to reframe our approach to the cult of the dead kin by situating it firmly within the realm of family and household religion in ancient Israel. And then finally, another uh, aspect of my approach to this study is recognizing that there are gaps in our evidence. So while we have plenty of material both in and outside of the Hebrew Bible pertaining to the dead and conceptions of the dead, this material resists easy, easy synthesis. And perhaps that reflects the diversity of ideology and practice within and among ancient cultures. And indeed, this seems to be the case even today for modern societies and the diverse ways in which they think about the dead. So moving into the beginning of the book, and I'm going to go chapter by chapter just to sort of survey some of the major moves that I make um, in this book and hopefully open up some possibilities for discussion later. So the study begins by situating the Israelite cult of dead kin in its ancient West Asian context through a comparison of the Hebrew Bible and epigraphic evidence from Judah with textual and material culture from Mesopotamia and Syria, Palestine. Uh, this comparison illuminates many features of the cult, including its underlying principles, its participants, and its constitutive practices. Because filial piety is an essential component of patriarchal societies, the cult of dead, dead kin then constitutes a key aspect of the social fabric, both in and outside of Israel. Now for the problem of definitions. Why cult of dead kin and not cult of the dead or ancestor cult? First of all, I, I wanna be clear about how I'm using the term cult in this context. So in this context, when we're talking about religion in the ancient world, it's not pejorative to use this term cult. In this context, cult refers to routine religious practice. It can refer to the cult of a particular deity like Yahweh himself, or as we'll see today, the cult of the dead. But why not ancestor cult? So I prefer not to use this term. It's, it's often used in previous studies. And the reason why I don't use the term ancestor cult in this book is that when we look at the evidence that's often used uh, to, to talk about this phenomenon, it often entails 
members of the same kin, kin group that are not elder predecessors. So by that, I mean that when we look both within the Hebrew Bible and outside of it in comparative literature from Mesopotamia, for instance, we see that people often offer the cult of dead kin, food offerings, commemorative monuments, invocation of the name, to family members who are not elder predecessors, right? So we see people offer this kind of care to their siblings, to their spouses, even to their children in some contexts. And so ancestor cult is a little bit too limited, too narrow in its scope. Um, and so that's why I prefer a broader term, the cult of dead kin. But why not cult of the dead? This is also a term that appears in previous studies. So the reason that I don't use cult of the dead um, as a term for this phenomenon is because that's a bit too broad, right? So cult of the dead could include everything from the care and commemoration of your dead family members to mourning the dead to necromancy, as we'll discuss later. And I think that cult of the dead then is just too broad of an umbrella it's important to use more specific terminology so that we can tease out the nuances and these different types of rituals that pertain to the dead. So throughout the book, I use this term, the cult of dead kin, emphasizing again, its embeddedness in the realm of family and household religion. So what are the constitutive practices of the cult of dead kin? The cult of dead kin in ancient Israel refers to a cluster of practices in which the living offer care to the dead in the form of food and drink offerings, as well as some other items like incense, commemorative monuments, invocation of the names of the dead, and the protection and when necessary repatriation of human remains. So I have just a few examples on the slides that follow to look at just some instances where we see uh, references to these kinds of rituals in the biblical text. So the first comes from Deuteronomy 26, 14, and this is a reference to the tithe, as you'll see. So the text states, I have not eaten, eaten of it, that is the tithe, while in mourning. I have not removed any of it while I was unclean, and I have not offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed Yahweh my God, doing just as you commanded me. So here in this reference to giving any of the tithe to the dead, we have then this assumption that it was possible to offer food to the dead. Now in previous studies, this text is sometimes cited as being indicative of a prohibition of offering food to the dead, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. The, the negative oath being made here, when the speaker is saying, I haven't given any of this, any of this food to the dead, seems to be concerned about the sanctity of the tithe itself, right? And then giving any of the tithe to the dead, you would be jeopardizing the holiness, right? The sacred quality of that tithe. So that seems to be the concern here, not an interest in this widespread prohibition against feeding the dead altogether. So here we have a reference then to that aspect of the cult of dead kin, offering food and drink offerings to the dead. Here we see a couple of instances in the biblical text that refer to commemorative monuments for the dead. So in the first passage, this comes from Genesis chapter 35, following the death of Rachel. So in this passage, we have a reference to the fact that her husband, Jacob, then sets up a commemorative monument, a pillar, a matzeva, at her grave right, commemorating his dead wife. So again, we get a sense of that the cult of dead kin is not just offered to one's ancestors, right, but to other family members as well. In the second passage that you see on the slide here, we have a reference to Absalom. Now, this is a, this is a really interesting passage, so I'm going to read it in its entirety here. So now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar that is in the king's valley, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar by his own name. It is called Absalom's monument to this day. So here, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in our discussion of gender in just a second. But here we have the recognition by Absalom that he doesn't have a son to commemorate him. And so he, it seems to have, you know, there seems to be an assumption, right, that, or reflection of his anxiety about not having someone to commemorate him, specifically a son to commemorate him, so he sets up his own commemorative monument to do so. So here are just a couple of examples then that reflect this aspect of the cult of dead kin. 
So as for the protection and repatriation of human remains, we actually have quite a few examples of this kind of activity geared towards the dead. But here's just one example coming from the book of Joshua. So this refers to the bones of Joseph, which the Israelites had brought up with them from Egypt, right? And were later reburied in his ancestral territory. So this expectation that people would repatriate the remains of their kinsmen who died abroad tracks not only with biblical evidence, but also with cuneiform evidence in contemporary societies. Now, an, an interpretive issue that arises in discussions of this material is why don't we have explicit prescriptive texts in the Hebrew Bible about these things? And it's really unclear. We don't have a good answer to this question. But this gap in the biblical text has led to different conclusions, different sort of arguments um, by different scholars. So one argument is that it was intentionally suppressed by biblical writers, that biblical writers intentionally tried to suppress the cult of dead kin, so they didn't want to describe it in too much detail in these texts because they didn't want anybody to you know, read these as prescriptive texts and then do these things. That's one argument. Another argument is that the cult of dead kin was only marginally important, right? That it actually wasn't practiced uh, very much. And then the third explanation is that the cult of dead kin for the most part is simply beyond the scope of interest of most biblical writers. Now, I tend toward this third option as you may have expected. The Hebrew Bible is not a handbook for religious life in ancient Israel. And it's relatively narrow in its focus. It's more often than not focused on royal interests or concerned with matters of national identity or crisis. So to give you one example, right? We saw, see, for instance, in the patriarchal narratives as well as many other narratives in the biblical text, this interest in progeny, right? One of the best things that you can do for yourself in the ancient world and certainly in ancient Israel is to have children according to many of these texts. So despite all that though, we don't have a single prescriptive text in the Hebrew Bible talking about how to deliver a child. There's no text in the entire Hebrew Bible that gives a step-by-step -step sort of instructional guide about how to deliver a baby or what to do with a baby soon after it's delivered. So similarly, you know, the same goes for death. Even though in text after text, we see reflected in them this interest in being buried well, being, you know, to die well and to be buried in a timely fashion and to be remembered by your friends and family. That seems to be an assumption of many biblical writers. Despite that, we don't have a single prescriptive text telling somebody how to bury a loved one. We only even have a few really detailed accounts of somebody's burial, a biblical character's burial. So we have to sort of reframe the way that we approach these texts um, in the biblical texts more broadly when we're trying to reconstruct what family and, and household religion may have looked like um, in ancient Israel and Judah. So in short, using biblical evidence and comparative analysis, we can see that this cultic care for the dead negotiated the ongoing relationships between the living and the dead, and in doing so helped structure these different landscapes in terms of the past. Now, moving into chapter two, I analyze the relationship between the cult of dead kin and other death-related practices. So, for instance, I analyze the cultic categories of necromancy and cult of dead kin and argue that these are actually separate religious phenomena in ancient Israel and in, the ancient, in ancient West Asia more broadly. So why does this matter, though? So it matters because these categories are often conflated in previous studies of the Hebrew Bible. And necromancy is condemned quite forcefully by several biblical writers. So here I just have a couple of examples where we see this kind of really staunch polemic. So here we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So this is a description of all these so-called abominable practices that the Canaanites get up to, right? So the text says, when you enter the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you, you shall not learn to act in accordance with the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you one who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. So this is a reference to child sacrifice. One who practices, and then we have this long list of different, you know, illicit forms of divination that I've left untranslated. One who inquires of Ove Yidoni, this is a technical term referring to necromancy, and one who seeks the dead, because anyone who does these things is an abomination to Yahweh. Because of these abominations, Yahweh your God is dispossessing them before you. 
So we see here this association between necromancy and abominable practices like child sacrifice. It's also associated with foreignness, according to this passage. In another passage in Isaiah 8, necromancy is characterized also negatively, but in a different way. So this passage says, surely they will say to you, consult the Ovot in Yedonim that chirp and mutter, for shouldn't a people consult their gods? And here the gods are referred to as Elohim. The dead for instruction and a message on behalf of the living. Surely they will say such a futile thing. The hard pressed and hungry will pass by. When they are hungry and angry, they will curse their king and gods. Whether they look above or to the netherworld, Eretz here, they will look and find distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish and thick darkness. So here in this passage in Isaiah, necromancy is also construed very negatively, but it's really emphasized that it's ineffective, that it's not an effective mode of divination according to this text. So why does this matter? We have this really staunch polemic against necromancy in several texts. And often in biblical scholarship, this staunch polemic is then incorrectly applied to other forms of death-related ritual, particularly the cult of dead kin. But there's good reason to separate necromancy from the cult of dead kin in the Hebrew Bible. As far as we can tell from the biblical evidence, the participants in necromancy are not members of the same kin group. In other words, it's not clear at all that someone would summon their dead relative in a necromantic encounter. In fact, in our only biblical example of a named dead person summoned in necromancy, the participants are not kin. This, of course, is the famous story about the so-called witch or necromancer of Endor. So this story is very well known. Um, it's one of my favorites in the Hebrew Bible, but I'm gonna save any discussion for it uh, for later on in this talk. Um, but in this story, Saul is desperate to get uh, a response from Yahweh, his God, and Yahweh's refusing to answer him. And so finally, when he's totally desperate, Saul attempts to get an oracle from Yahweh uh, by going to the necromancer of Endor and asks her to summon up the ghost of Samuel. And it's through this necromantic encounter that the dead prophet Samuel is able to tell Saul, you've totally lost the favor of your God and you're about to die, which we see uh, depicted here in this painting. So for our purposes here, in the context of this conversation, it's important to note that none of these participants in the necromantic ritual are kin, and neither the terminology in the passage nor the participants look like what we know of the cult of dead kin. Now, there's much more to say about this text, as I said, so I'll be happy to, to talk about it a bit more later on. Uh, but for those who are interested in this text and its history of interpretation, I'd highly recommend this book, uh, The Work of Esther Hamori on Women in Divination, uh, which I found particularly insightful. But as I said, for now, the most important thing to note is that biblical polemic against necromancy should not be applied to biblical conceptions of caring for the dead. And we'll be returning to this argument later. Chapter three examines the role of women in depictions of the cult of dead kin in ancient West Asia, particularly the extent to which women were involved in the cult. I argue that women had a much more significant role as both participants and recipients uh, in the Israelite cult of dead kin than previous studies have allowed. That said, some biblical texts do assume an ideal father-son configuration for the cult of dead kin. So we can think back, for instance, to the Absalom uh, passage that we read earlier, which refers to Absalom not having a son specifically to invoke his name. But that's not the only way in which the cult is portrayed in the Hebrew Bible, nor in comparative literature. So we can think back to another text that we talked about just earlier today, so the death of Rachel. In that case, she's a recipient of this care when her husband Jacob erects for her a Matziva, a commemorative monument at her grave. In another story, we have the character of Ritzva, who protects the remains of Saul's sons from further spoliation after they die in battle. And so you see depicted here, her fighting off all these wild animals, both birds of the air and beasts of the plain. So here we have uh, a reference uh, in 2 Samuel 21.10. Then Ritzba, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of the harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. So in this particular case, it's Ritzba who's offering the care, this, this care for the dead and protecting their remains. There's also another example 
uh, where we see women acting as those who provide care for the dead. And this appears in the famous Yad Vashem passage in Isaiah chapter 56, three through five. Here we have a reference to both sons and daughters, hypothetical sons and daughters of the eunuch that is commemorated by Yahweh instead. So others have noted that this passage draws upon the imagery of the cult of dead kin and referring to both the name of the dead and also a commemorative monument. So when Yahweh says, I will give to them in my house and within my walls a commemorative monument better than sons and daughters, that phrase, son, that phrase sons and daughters seems to suggest that not only sons but also daughters could, would ideally be responsible for offering this kind of care for their dead father. And again, we'll return to this passage about this eunuch uh, in just a little bit. So in terms of the role of gender in the cult of dead kin, it's important to note that especially in times of crisis, women are depicted as fulfilling the demands of the cult of dead kin. Now, this is a feature of ancient Mediterranean literature more broadly. So we can think, for instance, about the story of Anat and her brother Baal from the late Bronze City state of Ugarit. We can also think about the Isis and Osiris myth from Egypt, or even the famous Greek tragedy about Antigone and her brothers. Ultimately, the role of women in the transmission of tradition, genealogical descent, and the ritual observance of the cult of dead kin has been largely overlooked or de-emphasized in previous scholarship. However, some recent work has tried to emphasize and amplify these aspects of biblical literature. So on these topics, I'd highly recommend the work of Jacqueline Weintraub, who examines the role of gender in the transmission of biblical tradition, as well as Cynthia Chapman's excellent book titled The House of the Mother, which explores the social dynamics of maternal kin groups in the Hebrew Bible. I think I've lost count of how many times I've recommended this book in the last few years. So finally, chapter four evaluates the Israelite cult of dead kin and its relationship to both the Jerusalem temple and the Yahwistic ideologies of the biblical writers. I argue that the biblical depiction of Yahweh as divine caregiver for the dead draws upon the cult of dead kin in order to demonstrate the ongoing relationship between Yahweh and his people, Israel. Thus, rather than understanding locally based forms of cultic authority as inherently antithetical to more centralized forms of authority, we must instead appreciate the reciprocity between these spheres. More specifically, how biblical writers leverage the practices and ideologies of family and household religion. So I've already mentioned Isaiah 56, three through five, and its use of cult of dead kin imagery and affirming the covenantal relationship between Yahweh and the so-called eunuch. So in this text, Yahweh adopts the position of a family member commemorating the childless eunuch who presumably has no child to do so. Another post-exilic prophetic text that uses the same kind of rhetorical strategy is Ezekiel 37, the famous Valley of Dry Bones scene. So here we see you know, some of these dry bones lying in the midst of this valley, some of which have been re-sinewed, right? Literally remembered by God and reconstructed. But looking at verses 11 through 14, we also get resonances of the cult of dead kin. So the passage states, son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. They say our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are utterly cut off. Therefore, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says my Lord Yahweh, I am about to open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people. I will bring you to the land of Israel. You will know that I am Yahweh when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people. So here my analysis builds on the arguments of Saul Olean, who has written about this passage quite persuasively, um, stating that this is depicting an act of benevolent tomb opening, and that Yahweh himself is the one who will exhume the remains of the figuratively dead exiles and repatriate them back to the land of Israel. I argue further that this act by the deity himself leverages the imagery, practices, and ideologies of the cult of dead kin. And the text is doing that to make a point about covenant in the period following the Babylonian exile. So in other words, this is Ezekiel's way of asserting the ongoing covenantal status between Yahweh and Israel, that Yahweh continues to act as kinsman on behalf of his people, much like he does for the eunuch in the book of Isaiah. 
And in fact, this tapas of a deity or king acting like a cultic caregiver for the dead in times of crisis is attested outside of the Hebrew Bible as well. So it's not something radically different that the biblical writers are inventing here. So here's just one example where we find the same kind of behavior. So this comes from an 18th century uh, text called the Genealogy of the Hammurabi Dynasty. So after a long king list, uh, the text states the Palu or dynasty of the Amorites, the Palu of the Himeans, the Palu of the Gutium, the Palu not recorded on this tab tablet, and the soldiers who fell while on perilous campaigns for their lord, princes, princesses, all persons from the east to west who have neither Pekidu or nor Sahiru, these are kinds of cultic custodians, Come ye, eat this, drink this, and bless Amit Saduka, the son of Amidatana, the king of Babylon. So here, the Babylonian king is then taking on this role of cultic caregiver. He's becoming a pakidu, a caretaker for the dead, in the absence of any other living pakidu um, for all these different social groups, who some of whom have died, you know, on military campaign far from their homes. So this same kind of behavior is what we find in these prophetic texts of uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel, that they're using, you know, this kind of imagery of a cultic caregiver and casting Yahweh in this role, offering this kind of care to the figuratively dead uh, exiles. So because Yahweh acts as a caregiver for the dead Israelites, the covenant, which some thought was forever broken in this period, is still valid, according to these biblical writers. So this, to me, challenges the common argument in previous scholarship that biblical writers, especially in this period, the post-exilic period, are trying to subvert or marginalize the cult of dead kin. Instead, I posit that those reconstructions of Israelite religion, ones that emphasize a movement away from certain practices, particularly the cult of dead kin, and a movement towards certain ideologies like emergent monotheism, are more indicative of an evolutionary model of religion that has been incorrectly applied to the Hebrew Bible and religion in ancient Israel, and especially biblical ways of thinking about the dead. So in conclusion, putting all of this together, what can we say more generally about the work of the dead and the politics of death in the Hebrew Bible? We may note, for instance, that both families and nations are in a constant state of making and unmaking themselves, always losing and gaining new members. It is the ongoing project of both social groups to maintain some degree of continuity in spite of this constant change. This project of maintaining social cohesion uh, greatly depends on rhetorical strategies that treat that cohesion as natural, self-evident, something taken for granted rather than asserted or overtly challenged. Ritual then is a particularly potent tool in this kind of discourse. The rituals constitutive of the cult of dead kin offer richly symbolic ways to create, affirm, or contest affiliations in different spheres of Israelite society, including the internal hierarchies of families, the politics of kings, and the relationship between Israel and its patron deity. Following the trauma and political crisis of the Babylonian exile, the cult of dead kin becomes a particularly resonant discursive tool in biblical literature. In the midst of widespread social rupture, these rituals create a sense of continuity, social, political, and religious continuity that helps biblical writers articulate their visions of Israel's future. Now, there's much more to say on this point, but I'll stop there for now. Again, thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. So let me stop sharing the slideshow. Okay. Well, Carrie, thank you so, for such a wonderful presentation. And um, I guess I want to start out by just uh, making some comments that underscore the importance of your work. And I think uh, if it isn't evident from your own presentation, maybe an endorsement by an archeologist uh, struggling with similar topics uh, in earlier periods and right up through uh, Iron Age Israel uh, will add further to the sort of importance of, of what you have to say here. I, I wanna start out by uh, noting that the distinctions that you make right there at the beginning, I think are you know, they seem so simple once articulated, right? But it is remarkable that for, you know, nearly a century of uh, biblical and maybe the integration of biblical and archaeological studies in ancient Israel, maybe as we went through a sort of initial stage of archaeological uh, and historical surveys that tried to pull out topics from the text, uh, 
that it's taken a while to get the nuance to the different circumstances where we're looking at issues involving, as you say, very broadly, the care of the dead. And I really want to underscore that, that that distinction that you're making, you know, is certainly one made in other parts of the world with regard to archaeological evidence and the way we interpret the rituals and the material around burials. But I think it's really profoundly important in the context of the study of ancient Israel because there is a temptation, as you note, to sort of elevate everything to either, you know, this is pro-Yahwistic or non not, not positively supporting Yahwistic interpretations, which is, of course, the vantage point that most of the, the biblical narrative is reflecting. Um, and so that's, that is really, you know, to my mind, uh, exceedingly important. Of course, it, it, it vastly complicates our ability to um, reconstruct a lot of these issues, and that's not a unique problem to ancient Israel. It's something that we, you know, deal with across the ancient Near East when trying to integrate the text sources and and the actual practice of um, burial and all of the rites in and around it. Um, so, you know, your distinction between ancestor cult, um, uh, cults related to the dead more broadly, which I think you accurately point out, you know, it, it can be divested of kin and we don't really see too much of that sort of walking up to some uh, individual who's unrelated to you and commemorating them um, unless there's a very, you know, important perception of kin or other maybe political agenda, as yes. uh, you point out with uh, Saul's condition, but also one that goes way back uh, to the genealogy of Hammurabi and, and to the age of Amorites, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to underscore that for your audience, because as you started with that, and of course, um, then we got into the details of it with the various uh, episodes that you've articulated, this is a really uh, important contribution. And it's one of those ones that uh, you know, um, takes a takes a little bit of time to sort of digest and then think about its implications. One of the challenges, of course, and maybe you'll agree here in, in your own work with this, is that once one does make those distinctions and starts to take the, the few episodes in the Bible overall that we have that deal with the dead and put them into the appropriate context, of course, your corpus for any one of the topics that you want to look at, of course, shrinks because now you're looking at your sort of... Um, putting them in their proper context, right? So that's also a challenge uh, to our efforts. But I think that your, you know, phrasing it as the care for the dead is a really, really valuable contribution to uh, the approach and that uh, archaeologists, especially working in other areas, I think as your, your own bibliography for the book reveals, um, have started to sort of work through this issue. And sadly, in some places where they have a far fewer texts to really get at what people are thinking and, and how they were acting and, and, uh, and with respect to what's left archaeologically. So I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna, you know, underscore that and applaud you for that because I think it's a really, really important contribution and, it, and it's one of those things that we can lose sight of once we start getting into the details um, that, that are of course inherently important here. Um, I, I wondered if you, if you could say a little bit more about something that, I, that you touch on in your book um, and uh, maybe the directions that will go from here uh, in terms of um, future studies. But, you know, in, in I'd say easily the last couple of decades of biblical studies and the integration of biblical studies and archaeology, the diversity of religious traditions within Israel has become something that we're really interested in. And, you know, in my own archaeological work and when I'm teaching about it, I often make parallels to the Second Temple period where Josephus tells us about Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, Sicarii, and so forth. And then, of course, you know, uh, we have to sort of fill in that there's a, a range of behaviors in there. But the, you see a diversity in the text and then, of course, can look for it in the archaeology. And there's been this temptation to make things black and white for the study of ancient Judah and Israel, where you're either a Yahwist or you're not. Um, and then there's that complex reality, of course, of people's alignments. And I'm, I sort of wonder, um, you know, if you might have any other remarks on how you see us, uh, you know, beyond just saying that, that there's a diversity of practices, is there, is there a sort of future direction that we can see here uh, emerging in the way that we think about um, individuals being buried and how we start to place them within this landscape of diverse, um, you know, approaches to religious traditions in Judah? 
-hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your um, your compliments on the book, but and also for raising this question. I think it's a really important one. Um, you know, with my my students, I often tell them you need to be skeptical whenever a sentence begins with the Bible says, right? Because the Bible speaks with many voices, right? Um, that it's actually there. There are several voices that have been included in this anthology. And so, I mean, one example that comes from the material that we've we've just looked at today um, would be something like necromancy, right? So I showed a couple of passages that have this really staunch rhetoric against necromancy, really condemning it for different reasons. And so just that, right, is an important datum, that here are these two texts, one from Deuteronomy and from, one from the book of Isaiah, that are have a very, both have very negative views about necromancy, but they couch that rhetoric using very different language. They have very different rationales for why necromancy is bad, right? So that itself, I think, is really important. But then we can juxtapose that negative, that really staunch rhetoric with something like the necromancer of Endor story mm -hmm. um, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 28, where we find no condemnation of the practice of necromancy in that text. If anything, the female necromancer comes off looking pretty good in that text, right? That she effectively is able to raise the dead prophet Samuel, this great Yahwistic prophet from the dead, and is able to compel that prophet not only to appear, but to give a Yahwistic oracle, a real Yahwistic oracle to Saul when all these other methods of divination had failed him up until that point. So that passage that that story in first Samuel chapter 28 has really troubled interpreters and continues to trouble biblical scholars um, and and what to make of it right so you even find today some scholars who will say no the necromancer wasn't actually effective she didn't actually summon the dead prophet Samuel because it's difficult to reconcile right that particular depiction of necromancy with all these other texts that we have in the Hebrew Bible so I bring that up just because we've looked at some of those texts already, and it's a perfect example of what you've just described, right? The multivocality within the Hebrew Bible, especially where we don't expect it, right? And something like necromancy, this, this ritual, which, you know, pretty much everywhere besides 1 Samuel 28 is so strongly condemned by biblical writers. Even there, right, we see differences of opinion, different perspectives on this ritual and the role that this ritual plays in these different biblical texts. So I think it's a good reminder, you know, even something like, um, like necromancy in the context of these discussions about how biblical writers portray death to remind us, right, that you know, biblical writers speak from different perspectives and they're they're talking about these rituals in different contexts and using them, right? Really leveraging these practices for different purposes, depending on the text. Right. Um, so that's one way of answering your question. I mean, it's a big question, but that's just one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, the other thing that, that strikes me is, of course, and this is something of, you know, I'm coming from archaeology or coming from uh, textual emphasis, um, it's always what's not said, which is also interesting, isn't it? Um, and it, with regard to burials, you know, and, and the practices surrounding burials and, and the care for the dead, one of the things that you talk about in the book um, is the fact that we find in these tombs um, things, <laughs> you know, and, and ultimately we have to ask ourselves, and, and of course, uh, and I think you pointed out, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of a single instance where we get any sense of that from the Bible, that there are right. things in tombs. I mean, even in Job and the references to Sheol, which is sort of represents a, or, or what is described seems like a dry, dusty tomb. My recollection is that there's no description of anything being in there no. uh, except darkness and dust. No. Um, so it's a fascinating thing to try to reconcile the realities of that and whether or not that's, you know, is that per se categorized as part of a diverse set of counter Yahwistic practices that are persistent from some past, mm -hmm. or whether maybe they fall in a kind of neutral place. I mean, Michael Dietler invites us to consider that when people are in, engaging with, with practices that are foreign, you know, there's the ability, and, and this is probably more so on a range of adoption, rejection, or possibly complete indifference, in part because perhaps things are similar enough or, you know, based on, on, on more functional needs and have less to do with, you know, uh, clear and overt cultural choices. But um, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have any more thoughts along those lines, but it's always something that strikes me, you know, sort of the absence of evidence when we're dealing with these questions and how to reconcile that. Yeah, as you as you just pointed out, I mean, it really is frustrating trying to reconcile uh, textual evidence with archaeological evidence, especially as you say, when we have sometimes really rich material corpora, like I, we can think about bench tombs, for instance, right, the so-called paradigmatic form of Israelite or Judean burial. We don't really have any explicit references to the use of, of the bench tomb or even really the secondary burial, at least as we see it in the bench tombs. So as Matthew Seriano has pointed out in some of his work, we might have some sort of veiled references to the practice of secondary burial when we have, you know, especially in the Deuteronomistic history, these references to so-and-so was gathered to their ancestors or laid down, right, with his ancestors. Maybe that's a way of referring to the practice of secondary burial that we find in these excavation of bench tombs. But it is also striking to your point that we don't have any explicit biblical description of that kind of burial type, nor do we have an explicit description of some of these really important objects that we've excavated um, in Judah, like I'm thinking of the Judean pillar figurines, which have really bedeviled biblical scholars, right, and trying to think, okay, what, what texts might correspond, right, to this kind of ritual practice, the residue of which we find in the discovery of these different, of these figurines, this particular style of figurine. Um, so it's it's a it's a persistent problem that we encounter. And I think in the past, and I think there is a tendency not to do this so much today, but there has been in the past a, a real um, interest in projecting the biblical text onto right the excavations in, in the land of Israel. Um, but luckily, I think that the field has matured enough away from that tendency that we can just sort of sit and I think productively sit with the discomfort right of the mismatch between the rhetoric of these biblical writers and recognizing that as rhetoric and what we can dig up in these different excavations. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, if anything, it seems that it almost, you know, we've been invited to go in the other direction. We have this yeah. huge corpus of archaeological remains. I mean, there are very few places in all of the ancient Near East, really none, that are as intensively excavated and explored yeah. as uh, yeah. modern, the boundaries of modern Israel and, and Palestine have been explored. And uh, the data that we have invites us, as you say, to consider, you know, what it is we're looking at and reconstructing in and of itself yeah. um, over and against what is represented, as you say, in the biblical text. And, you know, as maybe others like Fleming have called it Judah's Bible, right? I mean, you suddenly zero in on, 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 on an area that uh, is sort of... Uh, and a, and, a, and a specific late Iron Age period that is reflected in this tradition. And then you ask yourself, really, am I asking the biblical text to do things that it can't do, right? Um, in that vein, you know, maybe as a sort of uh, closing um, uh, set of, of thoughts, I found it, uh, you know, your, your references of bringing the Amorite traditions in there um, to be uh, and, you know, maybe some of our viewers will realize, oh, my gosh, he's going to go down the Amorite uh, rabbit hole. But uh, I didn't do it. You brought it up. Uh, okay. So I, I will comment that I found, you know, this to be a really resonant uh, and relevant sort of uh, comparison in large part, because if we're looking at these issues, as you've talked about, in terms of a cultural stream mm. that the Israelites and, and later Israel and Judah and their neighbors are, are existing in, that perhaps is owing a, a great deal to second millennium traditions as you know, the Ugarit parallels and even Mari parallels yeah. indicate, um, then, then it really invites us to consider that many of these, you know, the stream that individuals are standing in sometimes is for them not even something worthy of commentary. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that literally, you know, there are these practices around burial, they may be practices around household cult, um, as you mentioned, that don't warrant any specific rhetoric, and they may not be uh, as abominable as biblical scholars have tried to retroject, right? And um, right. so I, you know, I, I found your reference to that um, particularly apropos, and, you know, I, I speak of it as a kind of Amorite cultural coin A, mm -hmm. um, and whether or not, you know, this is part of an issue of debate about whether or not it should be labeled Amorite at all, but it's certainly uh, agreed that there's a considerable sort of continuity there. One of the challenges, of course, with the bench tomb that you mentioned is that sort of lack of, of um, direct continuity. So there's a, a rupture in the burial tradition there in the early Iron Age. Um, 
that that is hard to reconcile against the fact that these Iron Age tombs have so much in common with late Bronze and Middle Bronze Age burial traditions with the loculus and, and, and uh, the way that it is shaped. Um, nevertheless, I think that there's, you know, a basis there for recognizing maybe a sort of latching on to an ideal type. So I don't know if I have so much of a question there, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see that many of us are coming at this problem from different vantage points and seeing some commonalities and potential for um, really highlighting those things that are significant, right, within the text that are that the biblical authors are highlighting, and um, recognizing likewise this kind of broad cultural stream that is shared uh, throughout the Levant. I don't know if you want to have a final word there on, on that sure. or anything else. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that observation, and that is the way that I think about the cult of dead kin broadly in ancient West Asia, um, that it is just so part of the fabric of how ancient societies structure themselves and maybe not even like so consciously so in some cases, it's just the sort of momentum of tradition. Um, you know, I, I talk about this with my own students where I ask them, you know, how would you rationalize some of these burial practices that exist today? Why do we leave cut flowers at a grave site? You know, it doesn't require a sort of articulated metaphysics, right, to determine people's actions, to, for people to still see those actions or feel them as deeply resonant. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, the religion of you know, temple cults and um, patron deities of, of these ancient societies is of a sort of different category from the cult of dead kin, because I think the cult of dead kin was just, it was inextricably tied up with how these, these societies were, were structured, were formulated. Um, and so I think because of that, um, again, without overemphasizing similarities and losing sight of differences, I think that also is a good sort of rationale for why we should look comparatively um, at you know, these different corpora, as you pointed out, from Ugarit, from Mesopotamia, also from Egypt, um, which I think has often been overlooked in these discussions of, of the cult of dead kin. And people like Christopher Hayes are doing a great job in really highlighting the similarities between those two corpora. Um, so thank you, I, I appreciate that observation. I, 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 share your, your, uh, I share your point of view. Well, it's been a delightful conversation, and I, I really hope that our uh, listeners will take an opportunity to, uh, to to read your book and to engage with it. I, I know that there's a great deal there that will be uh, built upon in the coming years, and I look forward to this ongoing conversation about it. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. Yes, likewise. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>